What's going on, everybody? I'm so excited to be back with another fantastic episode for all you OTs out there. Today, I have Miranda Rennie from the OT Uncorked podcast on the show, and we discuss a variety of different OT topics, including transitioning from being a new grad to practitioner, working in an outpatient neuro setting, as well as her passion for learning, teaching, and research. Miranda shares some wonderful insight about the importance of evidence-based practice and tips on how to integrate it into your clinical work. So without further ado, let's bring on Miranda and uncork some fun topics in occupational therapy. Cheers! If you're interested in occupational therapy, this is the place for you. This show aims to explore our profession by sharing who we are and what we do. Because for us, occupational therapy is more than just a job. Hi, I'm Sarah. Welcome to OT for Life. So most of my listeners know how much I absolutely love going to occupational therapy conferences. And this conversation is one of those reasons because this conversation actually came out of us meeting at the last AOTA conference. And uh, yeah, I want to give a little shout out to Devlin New, the Rainbow OT. Yes. Because it was because of him that we met and connected. And you know what happens when you get two OT podcasters chatting. We talked for hours. I think it was like, Two, maybe over two hours? Yes, yes, it absolutely was. I didn't go to any sessions that afternoon and I gained so much from our conversation. So, so worth it. <laughs> yeah, I think I had one planned and then I was like, eh. Or no, actually, I think I had a couple planned and I'm like, oh, I'll skip the first one. Like, this is an awesome conversation. And the second one, I'm like, no, this is still good. We just like kept talking <laughs> and like literally pulled chairs over like in the poster session and just like sat there and it was amazing. They say that life happens when you're busy making other plans. And I think it's so true. The best things happen when you're planning other things. So it was all meant to be. <laughs> Completely. I was, I was like so excited when I found out that you were another OT podcaster and hearing all about your show, which we will get into a little bit later. But I kind of like to just jump in and hear a little bit about what your OT life looks like currently. Yeah, so I am a fairly recent graduate. I graduated in May of 2018. And I since then, have worked in a university health system with an adult neurologic population. So most of the people I'm seeing day to day have experienced traumatic brain injury, stroke, spinal cord injury. I see some movement disorders as well. It's been really fun. I got to work in both inpatient rehab and I'm currently working in outpatient. So seeing that continuum of care and even actually treating some of the same patients, which has been really fun when there's been overlap where I treated someone in inpatient and now I'm seeing them for their outpatient care. It's been just so neat to see people's progress and be part of kind of one of the hardest parts of these people's life so far in a lot of cases, really meeting them at their most vulnerable point in inpatient and partnering with them to progress towards their goals. It's just been so rewarding and a pretty exciting kind of way to start out my career. And in my current role, I also have the opportunity to help teach at a university. So I partner with professors to, you know, do some guest lecturing. I come in and help lead patient labs and offer some of that clinical perspective. It's so fun because I'm so recently out of OT school that I remember what it's like to not have the pieces come together. I know what it's like before field work when you know so much but you don't necessarily have the full picture of occupational therapy. I mean, I guess, do any of us have the full picture yet? But uh, it's been so rewarding to help partner with these students and kind of help them figure out that they really do know so much and prepare them for that next step in their career, which is graduating and moving on to actually working with, with people. I Yeah, I totally resonate with that because, yes, I've been out of school for many years now, but that's actually one of the reasons that I really enjoy taking fieldwork students is because I get to have that connection and I get to help those students and mentor them through that entire process of being like, hey, I was exactly like you guys. I felt like I didn't know anything. It took me a while to kind of connect the dots and get everything going. 
but really kind of trying to like instill that confidence in them at that time period of like, you'll get through it, you'll make it, everything will be fine. Absolutely. And it's so important. And I remember the people who were who were like that for me in OT school. And so just already so soon after graduating, uh, just a year really, being able to already give back in that way has been really exciting. And I really enjoy that part of my job. Completely. So I'm curious, because for me, like I've I was always 100% pediatrics, like peds brain all the way. Did you always know that you were going to be going into working with this population and also going into teaching? As far as this population, not at all. And as far as teaching, I have always really enjoyed teaching from when I was in high school, I would help teach a Sunday school class. I did that through college actually as well. I've always enjoyed doing presentations. Public speaking is actually something I enjoy. I guess that makes sense. Not not super surprising since I have a podcast. But I love <laughs> I love talking. I love teaching. I love meeting people. I was a writing tutor for five years and that was just one of the favorite parts of my day was was working with people. We, I actually really followed kind of an OT model for approaching tutoring as well. So I've always kind of really seen the connection there and seen that some of my skills could be well used in a teaching environment. But as far as the adult neurologic rehabilitation component of my career, I did not expect that. I became an OT because my best friend when we were when we were growing up, my best friend in elementary school had an OT and her OT absolutely changed her life. She was not able to participate in testing in schools. So even though we all knew she was intelligent and creative and just had an amazing personality, she wasn't able to speak or write. And so they were never able to actually measure what she knew. And it was her occupational therapist in fourth grade that created this head pointing device essentially out of just knickknacks she had in the classroom. And my best friend was able to then communicate and participate in a basic test. And even though I don't necessarily believe that test scores are going to show much of a person of who they are, it was so empowering for her to be able to express what she knew in some way. And as soon as her OT did that, I was sold. (laughs) I said, I want to do this for somebody else. And so I was full on pediatric mode. I was excited to be a pediatric OT from the time I was, I was indeed in the pediatric population about 10 years old. (laughs) I was sold. Yeah. And so I was pretty set on that all growing up. I was always volunteering with pediatric organizations that helped people with, with a whole range of childhood conditions and social barriers, kind of overcome those. And that what I was, what I was really passionate about. And then through school, I just learned so much more about other areas that occupational therapists can be involved in. And my favorite class was our neurologic class um, in the biology department, the one that many people I know failed out of. It was my favorite. I was so motivated to come to class. And I thought this, this might be my thing. I feel like I hear that all the time where people come in and then they end up switching. I was like the exact opposite. I came in, I knew exactly I wanted (laughs) pediatrics and 10 years later, I'm still doing pediatrics. And so I always find it really interesting when people tell me like, yeah, I started always wanting to do peds and then I switched or I always wanted to do older adults and then I switched to peds or whatever it is. So that is absolutely fascinating that you were exposed to occupational therapy so early on. It's so funny because throughout your, you know, K through 12 schooling, you know, how they have you do a lot of career projects mm-hmm. and you usually start out. It's like, I want to be a firefighter. I want to be a teacher. And then I want to be a doctor. And it just changes. So every year your presentation is so different. Mine was so predictable, but it was fun because I was always learning something new. <laughs> It was like not even a question. I know no. <laughs> Miranda's going to be an OT. That's it. <laughs> right. I was pretty set. I'm, I guess I'm kind of predictable, which isn't always a bad thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I'll tell you what, though, for people who might be listening, who are maybe even still in OT school or have been a clinician and are interested in a career switch or start to feel sort of that inclination towards something else. I can relate to sort of this identity crisis that happens when you know what you want to do for so long and then something switches. And it's so exciting that in our career, it's about the approach and the way of thinking as an occupational therapist. And we can apply that with, of course, some 
extra learning and always trying to further our skills. But we can apply that to any group of people that we want to work with. And I think that's so freeing about occupational therapy and truly one of the things that drew me to it. Yeah, I actually I have a little story about that because oh. I mean, I am I'm so specialized like in pediatrics, in early intervention, birth to three years of age, like that's my jam. <laughs> and that's my wheelhouse. That's what I'm comfortable with. Although yes, I've had experience up to age 21, basically. But I was actually doing some volunteer work and I, I volunteered with lots of organizations across the globe. And I have had the opportunity to work with non-pediatric clients. And as kind of scary and kind of outside of my wheelhouse as it is, I'm able to just take the skills that I know as an OT and apply it to any population. Of course, like I'm I'm pulling things out from memory and from, you know, readings and other things that I remember from school and from chatting with colleagues and all that kind of stuff, but I was actually able to still do OT even though it was populations that I don't work with and haven't worked with in many years. Right. And and like I said, I really think OT school prepares you to think differently, and I don't think I realized that until I was out of school. And even just talking with family and friends, I make a suggestion that to me just makes perfect sense. And it's a clear way to adapt or grade an activity or change the environment. And to me, it seems so, so expected or so, I don't know, I guess second nature that I almost don't even suggest it. But when I do, it's like revolutionizing to them. And I think that made me realize we really do learn a way of thinking and a way of approaching everything that we do and everything that everyone else does. And that way of thinking is so transferable across settings, across populations to our own lives. And that's kind of cool. I don't know how many careers have that. Maybe they do. Yeah. But I love that. Oh, I, yes, I totally agree. Because I feel like so many times my mom will come with me with some sort of like pain or complaint or a friend that has something going on. And you can literally sit there and kind of dissect this the situation, you know, do your own little activity analysis and then break it apart and really figure out, okay, this is what's going on. And here are some solutions, like go try it out and see what works for you. And it's fascinating because I think a lot of people, they'll look at me and be like, oh, but you only work in pediatrics. So like, how can you help? How can you help me? I'm 30 years old or I'm 50 years old or however old they are. And it's like, but it's not even that. It's the lens that we use in order to approach a situation and find a solution. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. Do you have one moment of being an OT that really kind of stands out to you as uh, maybe the highlight of your career so far? You know, I can't necessarily think of one major moment off the top of my head. But sometimes it's a lot of the little moments that add up together that really remind me why I'm doing what I'm doing. I was working with a patient who was seeing me for for kind of a chronic condition, but he also was experiencing depression pretty severely. And it was impacting his occupational performance across all of his occupations. And it was really hard for him to even come into therapy He ended up being hospitalized for a little while. And when he came back to see me, he came in one day. It was the day after he discharged from the hospital. And I didn't even expect him to come to his appointment. I thought he would, you know, be a no-show because he had just gotten out of the hospital. I, you know, I can't blame him. And he showed up to therapy and he truly looked like he was in so much pain and like it was taking every ounce of energy to get there. And I looked at him and I said, I'm not sure if a month and a half ago you would have come in today under the same circumstances. And he looked at me and he said, you know, I think you're right. I think my outlook has changed. And I said, I am so proud of you. I'm so excited for you and what this means, but it's okay if you're too tired today to do therapy. We can modify and kind of do something that's at at the level you're able to tolerate today. And he said, you know, I'm just glad I'm here. This place is so important to me. I just need to be here right now. And that was so moving for me because I realize that we play such an important role in people's lives. And like I said before, we're seeing people at their most vulnerable. And it is just such a privilege to be part of that. And it's those little moments where someone tells me that coming into therapy is a highlight of their day or something that we did empowered them to go home and participate in something they haven't done in months. And so I think it's a lot of the little moments that really keep me going. And I think, too, that just kind of ties into really kind of getting our clients to understand our role. Because I, I, I like and I'm going back to what you just said about how a month or a month and a half ago, he wouldn't have shown up. And then right. all of a sudden, after a little bit of time and after working with you 
even though he was at a very, very low point in lots of pain, tired, probably stressed, lots of stuff going on, he knew and he believed the value of what OT can do for him. And so he showed up because he knew that it was important. Yeah. And that is such a cool feeling, I think, for everybody involved. Yeah. And I think like one of the things that I thought about was just like being present because it sounds like he showed up and it's like, yeah, I probably shouldn't be here, but I know that this is important and I know that this is going to make me get better. So even though I'm not at my best and shouldn't have been there in his mind, he's like, I'm going to show up because I never know what impact this is going to have. And he knew that there was going to be like a massive impact. So being that you are somewhat of a new grad, I mean, a year out, I'm going to still kind of put you in that in that new grad bubble. I want to know like what that transition from OT student to OT practitioner was like, because I'm, I'm sure there was some limiting beliefs and some challenges that you had to face. And I'd love for you to kind of explain what that looked like for you, what it felt like and 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 how you kind of have gone through that transition. So when I graduated from OT school, I didn't have a lot of experience with the population I was going to be working with. Just the nature of how our field works were assigned, the opportunities that were available were great. Not necessarily, though, quite in line with the job I took. And so I think one of the hardest transitions for me was being confident that I actually do have the skill or I I'm confident that I did have the skills at the time, even just graduating OT school, I had the skills I needed to some extent, but there was so much development that needed to happen. And so I think one of the challenges was coming into a new workplace with new colleagues and needing to be a confident therapist, but also leaning on the expertise and experience of others and being really honest where I have shortcomings. I don't think I'm alone in saying that I don't like when I'm not good at things. <laughs> I think we actually talked about this at AOTA. I don't like being bad at things that I want to be good at. I don't know if anyone really enjoys that feeling. And I wanted, I wanted to avoid that feeling as much as possible. And part of that was really acknowledging where am I lacking in my skills or What are areas that I need to develop to better serve this population? And then how can I connect with the resources that I need? And in a lot of cases, that meant just getting mentorship from peers or calling friends who had also just graduated from OT school and swapping ideas. So I would say that was one of the hardest parts of the transition. I think one of the, on the flip side, one of the better parts of the transition is finally getting to do what I've been studying to do for years. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right. I think too, I think confidence is something that most new grads deal with, if not all. Like I'm sure there's a few that graduate and they're like, yeah, I've got this. I've been studying it. <laughs> I have lots of experience like volunteering and maybe even working in the settings uh, before they became an OT. But I feel like a lot of new grads and myself included, you come out, you have this wealth of knowledge, you have this passion to go change the world basically. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, now what? And I actually, I really like that you said that you took on a role that you didn't have a lot of experience in, but you weren't afraid to just go and try it. Because I think a lot of new grads are like, oh, I have to go into a similar area that I did my field work in, or that I had like a specific class in. And, you know, that's not necessarily the case. Like you can go into a new realm that you don't know much about and, really just try to figure it out. And you're going to have to spend some time looking at resources and reading and learning. But that doesn't mean that you can't do it. Right. And and how great is it that when you're just coming out of school, you're in that learning mindset, you are in that sort of pattern and, and habit of reading and looking at the literature, finding podcasts that talk about relevant topics. <laughs> Read it, it. Reading, yeah, Always right? plugging. Little, little shameless plug here for us. And reading blogs and just meeting people, going to conferences. You know, we have so much that we're used to doing as students and being able to bring that into further professional development, I think it's a little easier for new grads potentially than people who have been out in the field for a while. I don't know if that's true for everyone, but I definitely see an advantage there. So why not dive into something that's a little bit unfamiliar? I feel like it's so much easier these days to connect to resources because of the influence of technology, you can Google 
anything or YouTube or listen to a podcast and even just connecting with somebody that has more experience or is looking to get into an area that you have questions about as well. And so like I remember when I was in school, it's going to make me sound like a dinosaur, but (laughs) Pinterest was, I don't think a Pinterest was really a thing in school. I remember it as a new practitioner, but it was barely, it was barely out there. And like nowadays, I literally, because I do a lot of like recycled activities. And so I'll literally pick up like an egg carton, for instance, and go to Pinterest and put in egg carton, fine motor activity, 18 months. And I will get a list of all these ideas that I can do with an egg carton for kids around that age range. And I'm like, oh my goodness, like that is the coolest thing. And it's just, it's so easy. And it's just like right at your fingertips. Right. Oh, I think that I can't imagine if I didn't have Pinterest, I'm sure I would still be a good OT, but it's so helpful. But I got to call you out on something. I think the first time you said that, you said a Pinterest, which does make you sound like a dinosaur. <laughs> oh, did I say a Pinterest? <laughs> I, think, I think you did, which just kind of cracked me up over here. Oh. Um, <laughs> That's like the but, Facebook, all right? I don't know if you're, if you're old enough to know that, but it used to be the Facebook. And you used oh, to yeah. actually have to type in the Facebook in your web browser, all right? Oh, no, that I didn't know. That, uh-huh. yes. But something you were saying about Pinterest, too, is that there's so many resources there. And yet everything you're taking from Pinterest, whether it's that egg carton activity or any of the other hundreds of ideas that you probably are taking, you know, taking away from Pinterest, it still requires an OT to decide which activities are going to be appropriate for each person, how you're going to modify them, how you're going to make it that just right challenge. And I just think that's so cool that even though we're all pinning things, it still takes all of our education to really support how we're going to use that therapeutically. I just think that's so neat. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. And how we can literally take like one material or like one activity and utilize it across the board for different populations, but based on the need of the client and based on the therapist clinical judgment, it can literally be the same thing, but just tailored and tweaked just slightly to meet the needs of the clients. Right. What we do is just so fun. I just nerd out to it. <laughs> I think that's probably why we both started podcasts. I think so. I think so. (laughs) No wonder we have so much in common. (laughs) I know. I like I can talk about this stuff like all day long and totally just OT geek myself out. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Um, So in thinking about your transition from student to new practitioner, is there anything that stands out as something that you felt like you did well as or something that you were really, really prepared for? as you embarked on being a new practitioner? I think one thing was I had a lot of fresh ideas and I hadn't kind of fallen into a routine yet. So something I was really prepared to do was try things. And if it didn't work, jump into plan B, C, D, kind of go down the line, but also incorporating evidence into that. I didn't realize how recent sort of this evidence-based practice push had been in our profession until I talked to people who really weren't that far out of school and didn't feel like they were prepared to see what the research is saying what anecdotally even is coming out through case studies. And I felt like that was something that I was so adept with that I could just quickly between sessions in five minutes, even just kind of skim through an article to verify some ideas I thought I remembered, or that I was pretty sure was evidence based kind of quickly take a glance, maybe look at it over lunch. And I realized not everybody really has that skill. And so I felt very prepared as a new practitioner to justify why I was doing what I was doing. And when there's a lot of questioning about, am I even doing this right? Am I doing OT? Like, what what is this? Um, And you start to really doubt yourself. We talked about that confidence piece. Mm -hmm. That was something I felt really confident in. And, you know, when I would get the comment, when I'd walk into a patient's room and, you know, I've gotten before you 17, right? Or are you an, are you an aide? And I knew that when I was going in there, that my interventions were evidence-based. I knew that I was ready to work with them and help them re- reach their goals. And so I could confidently explain to them why we were doing what we were doing. And that was really important in that, again, in that confidence piece when so much else is, is definitely a challenge as a new practitioner. Okay. So I love that you just brought up the whole evidence-based practice and use of evidence within our practice, because I do, I feel like a lot of people struggle with this piece. And I think people that are in school and some of the newer grads, they have a really good handle on it. But maybe some of the people that have been in the profession for a while or just 
aren't as up to date with using technology and all that kind of stuff, the evidence piece can be a hurdle. It can be a challenge for a lot of us, especially like OT and emerging practice areas where the research really hasn't caught up to what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that you've like came out of school with this confidence, but I'd like to hear if you have any tips or strategies for people that might be struggling with this skill. Like what would be some tips that you would have for somebody that might be struggling with incorporating evidence into their practice? I think one piece of advice would be, you know, you mentioned before about how we have access to so much through some of sort of the modern technologies and we can just go onto Google Scholar or log into our university account if we still have access to those and research. So I would actually recommend for people who are struggling, one struggle I've noticed is that people feel like they're, they're not doing enough researching. They're, they've read a few articles even, which is above and beyond what a lot of people are even doing. And they feel like because they have access to so much information that they need to have access to it all now. And I would actually advise, you know, take some time with one topic of interest. And I notice it's kind of been changing every couple of weeks for me. There's something that I really just want to dive into, either refresh my memory on or go a little deeper that's relevant to my patient care. And just read a few articles at a time, maybe one a week. Start with that. Don't feel like because you have access to it all that you need to know it all right away. So I think sort of the overshooting is kind of a barrier to people. But then the other issue is that at the end of a long workday, it's exhausting. Our jobs are self-fulfilling, but they can also be really tiring, right? Mm -hmm. And it can be really hard to come home and want to sit down with a journal article and really dive in again to OT when you've been doing that for the past 10 hours <laughs> or whatever your workday looks like. And so I think actually OT practice offers a good starting point because they're written a lot of times by people who are actively working with clients, writing about their experiences, things they've found. And I see that that's kind of an inspiration point for me that then I can go in and see, okay, what's also evidence-based that's beyond what they talked about in OT practice. Or I read a blog post that's really engaging, easy to read, and it brings up a topic that I'm really interested in. And then I can go back to the literature. And I always find when there's something that's sort of a, a springboard for either conversation or for the reading, it's a little more motivating. So that would be a piece of advice I would have for people. The other thing is asking other maybe more seasoned clinicians, hey, what are you doing when you you know meet someone who's having this challenge? See what they're doing and then do some investigative work, right? We're really good at that as OTs. Do some investigative work and kind of figure out, hey, is what they're doing the best? And not in the, and I want to clarify, don't go and tell them it's not the best. <laughs> but say, what else could I do to make that even better? How can I take what's being done and, and apply what I know to it? So then you're not starting from scratch. You're starting with what somebody else has offered you as far as an idea or experience. And you say, okay, well, I know I can bring something to the table. And you combine that with their ideas. And I think that's so much of kind of a lower barrier to integrating evidence-based practice. I think you nailed it with those comments that you just said. Like, there is so much research out there. And there's so many different avenues that you can access the research through. So it's almost like, a, like you almost get like paralyzed, like, oh, where should I go? Where should I try to find all of this? And then also that productivity piece. I think in, unfortunately, in this day and age, like so many of us therapists, we are just overworked and we don't have the time at work to be doing this. And then finding the time at home to like take away from our home life to then be able to read an article and digest it and then be able to bring it back to work. It's, it's definitely a barrier. And I feel like, at least for me, like that's been a big reason that it's really hard to be able to integrate the evidence because there's just a lack of time these days. Yeah. Can I also say for new grads, obviously there's so many job opportunities and when you find what you want to do for that season of your career, dive in. But I really found it beneficial working for a health system that's affiliated with a university or working for a nonprofit, which in this case I you know, it's, I am double dipping there. It's both, <laughs> but working for somewhere that maybe isn't, even if they're productivity driven, they're also very research driven can be so helpful because I think that we find there's maybe more like-minded people in that setting as far as really wanting to dedicate yourself to, to the research. I think some of those conversations are going to happen even more organically in that kind of setting. So not to say, you know, you can't go anywhere else, but if that's something you're concerned about, see what opportunities exist in, in that kind of nonprofit or university-based 
or affiliated health system, that might be an option too. So it sounds like, I mean, it sounds like you're in a great spot where research and evidence is really on the forefront. But what about the people that might be listening where they are at a facility or working for an organization where it's kind of brushed aside, or at least it's not the very first thing that's talked about? What would you say to somebody? Like, how how can they advocate to become a little bit more evidence-based or just to bring more evidence with, into that practice area? That is a great question. And when you find out the answer, let me know <laughs> and I'll spread the word. Um, one thing though, in all seriousness though, that I, I hear, cause obviously I'm not in that setting, so I don't have that lived experience right now, but I think connecting with others is so important. And we've talked about some ways people can connect, but finding other people who are in those practice settings. And even if you're working together with someone else who's across the country, working in a similar situation or in a similar setting, just starting that conversation can be really I think engaging and motivating and you can kind of build each other up and just knowing you're not the only one struggling with something can go a long way too. That's not a great answer for how to become more evidence-based, but I think it's definitely a first step. I just asked the question because I'm curious because I know, well, I'm sure there are people that are out there that they want to be more evidence-based, but there's so many challenges within their organization that they find that they're not able to. And so I was just curious. Uh, I'm jealous. It sounds like, you know, where you are, it's like, yeah, evidence, evidence is, evidence is great. But a lot of places, I don't think that's the case. And I feel like there's been a big push within the last couple of years for it, but it's still kind of taking some time to really start to bring it to the forefront and really start to integrate it. And, you know, I, I feel like a lot of places aren't quite there yet. And I think I like what you said about going and doing the research and then going to your colleague or maybe a a mentor or supervisor or something like that. And it's not necessarily telling them that they are doing something wrong, but it's adding to the tools. It's adding to what's already being done and saying, here's another suggestion and look at the positive effects that it had on this population or this diagnosis. And so I think just kind of continuing to advocate for the clients and advocate for the profession by utilizing some of the literature that is already out there and saying like, hey, maybe we could we could look at this and consider that as an addition to what is already being done. I really like what you said about, you know, kind of reinforcing that idea of going to your colleagues and starting those conversations. And I think that can really change a culture. If you're challenging your colleagues to, you know, you collaborate with you and say, Hey, I have so much to learn from you. Here's an idea I had. What can we do with this combination? And I think that when we want to be better and we engage other people in that process, they want to be better too. And when they want to be better, they want to make us better. And I just think that's a really wonderful cycle that if you can get into it, it can make a difference. And when a whole culture of an organization changes, again, I haven't experienced this in OT because of the current setting I'm in, but I would imagine that if all the employees, all the therapists are getting together and maybe even over lunch, just talking about what's been working and what hasn't been working and what they've been reading or what they've been hearing, what they learned at a CEU course, I I have to believe, maybe it's the optimist in me, but I have to believe that management's going to notice And they're going to even value the therapist even more, right? And I would hope that that could then sort of snowball into into maybe an environment that's more continuing education or more in services where colleagues are sharing with one another, more kind of protected time for that. So again, maybe it's the optimist in me, but I kind of like the sound of it. Ah, I think that sounds great. I I love the fact of like, yeah, just having having a lunch where you talk about a topic and and bring in some literature to support or, you know, not support whatever that treatment strategy is or the population, whatever, like whatever it is, like there's there's so many different ways that you could spin it. And I kind of want to give a little bit of a shout out to another OT podcaster. Oh, OT potential, Sarah Lyon. I love her. She's great. You know, <laughs> you knew exactly where I was I going know. with this. <laughs> I actually almost mentioned her before and then I got sidetracked, but she was on my mind that whole time. <laughs> yes. You know, I, I totally almost did the same thing. And I'm like, but now that we're talking about evidence, I'm like, <laughs> this is perfect because I think her podcast would be a great way. And it, I mean, it's something that I listen to. And it's a great way to get exposed to the literature that's out there 
And it's like all encompassing because, I mean, she's been talking about all different topics. It's not just adults or peds or mental health or anything like this. It's like across the board. So we'll give a little shout out to Sarah Lyon from the OT Potential podcast. And I absolutely love what she's doing over there, where basically every week she is highlighting one article And she'll talk about it briefly and then have a conversation discussing the outcomes of that article. And it's just a great way to stay connected kind of across the board on lots of different articles. And the other thing I I like about it is that she's not always pulling just from OT journals. Really, really cool. And I love, I love what she's doing over there. Yeah. And you know what? Her episodes are, it's, it's what, like less than 10 minutes. And truthfully, listening to any OT podcast on your commute, that's such a great way to be, I truthfully, I find it so energizing to listen to all of you guys because I leave work and I just hear everyone else geeking out about OT and I feel like I'm in on the conversation and I'm learning and I'm laughing and that is the right level of nerdiness you need after work, right? And it's the right level of learning where I'm I'm gaining so much and it's while you're driving, right? You would already be driving or taking the bus or walking from work. So why not use that time for some kind of personal development? Yeah, and I think it's funny too cuz at least I was I was totally this way. I used to be such like a music junkie and I would listen to music all day, every day. Like I was that type of person that I would make, I would create a playlist every day. So I knew <sighs> exactly like what I was going to listen to. And when podcasts kind of popped onto my radar, I'm like, ooh, they're cool, but I'm not sure. Like I have a lot of m- music to listen to. I don't know when I'm going to integrate them. And then I just slowly like started listening to them and I'm like, oh, this is good. Oh, this one's good. And I almost kind of became addicted to it. And I was actually just having this conversation with a friend where it's like, well, but I like listening to music in the morning. And I'm like, just just try. Just put on, put on an <laughs> OT podcast, right? Also an OT. And he did. And he was like, oh my gosh. He's like, I was so inspired. I was so motivated. I was like ready to go tackle the day. And usually it's like, I need, I need the music in order to do that. And so I I think this like just ties in so nicely to what we were talking about that listening to OT podcasts and even non-OT podcasts to really just kind of plant the seed to bring about more awareness, hear stories from other people in the field and just kind of inspire us to continue to be 1% better. Right. And that's, that's the easiest way to do it. None of us are going to become the OTs that we want to be overnight. It's going to be a career long process. And the little steps that we take, I really think add up. Definitely. So now that we're on this kind of topic, I, <laughs> I think this is a great segue to learn a little bit more about your show and where this idea for OT Uncorked came from. So a few months before I was graduating from OT school, I was starting to wonder if I would, when I got into a job, if I would kind of fall into a routine that would kind of, I would maybe self-created barriers, I'm not sure, to learning and meeting new people. And I'm very social and I love learning. So I said, I need to figure out a way to kind of keep this up. I don't like falling into sort of routines that, that don't involve learning and socialization, truthfully. It was kind of selfish ambition. It was selfish ambition to start where I said, I I love meeting cool people. It was wonderful to have guest lecturers come in into school or network at, at academic events. But I wanted to keep that up outside of school. When I started to have the idea for OT and Cork, it was a few months before I graduated. And I thought, hey, I'm probably not the only person that wants to keep learning and who loves meeting cool people. So if I do this on a more public platform, I can share what I'm learning with other people. So it really was about what can I learn moving forward from really cool people who are doing wonderful things in our field and even outside of our field too. But why why a podcast? Because there, there's lots of different ways that you can be doing what you were just talking about. So why why specifically a podcast as opposed to, say, YouTube or a blog or something like that? So I... I've told you this before, Sarah, but I'll tell the listeners, I was never a big podcast person. So a few months before I graduated, I was kind of dabbling in podcasts a little bit and I would follow a few, but 
not, I wouldn't keep up with him every week. And I would kind of jump around to a few different podcasts, more so based on whatever topic was being talked about. And I really did realize that I, I enjoy learning through listening, which is what has drawn me to a lot of TED Talks and audiobooks written, spoken by the authors. But I really have never been a podcast junkie, which is so funny that I had this idea, I'm going to start a podcast. But part of it is, I think just my personality that I don't like to dip my toes in anything. I kind of like to just jump right in. (laughs) So I thought, you know, I'm liking some of these podcasts. This is something I can get into. Why don't I just do my own? And I, I don't know why that's like, yeah, I think it's just my personality, which is kind of, kind of funny, I guess that I just thought, yeah, I'm going to do this. So it was probably April of 2018 when I said, all right, I'm doing OT uncorked. (laughs) Oh my goodness. I, I, so I, I actually, I knew this story and I love this story because I was the opposite where I'm like, I'm, I'm a podcast junkie. I love podcasts. I listen to them all day, every day. Yeah. Why don't I just start one my own? And you're like, eh, I think they're cool. All right, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what it was. And you know what? Even more than that though, I saw it as a challenge and I love a good challenge. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well then we can agree on that because Yes, it it's definitely I knew it was going to be a challenge going into it. And I'm kind of thinking back where you were saying that like public speaking, like you've always kind of liked public speaking and have felt confident in it. And I'm like again, I'm like such the opposite where I'm like, oh, I'm not a good <laughs> public speaker, so why a podcast? It totally doesn't make sense for me except that I listen to them. And so it's like there's a lot of similarities, but then <laughs> there's a lot of actually big differences too. And I think it's funny that we both just ended up starting an OT podcast. Yeah. I'll tell you what though, and I think you could probably relate to this, but it's, it takes a lot of confidence to just publish that first episode and to say, is anyone going to listen to this? Is this even something people would enjoy? And am I the right person to do it? So much so. Oh my goodness. I think if it wasn't for my husband, and then Brock Cook from the Occupied podcast, and then my buddy Leo. Those three were the three that were like, you have to do it. Yeah. And I think without them, I I still would probably be recording and have it, like wouldn't have released anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I went through that period of time too. So I had this idea in April of 2018, and I didn't publish my first episode until April 2nd, 2019. So a year went by between sort of the conception of the idea and actually going through and publishing. And I agree with you. There's so many people that were kind of telling me, hey, you talked about that idea. What are you doing with it? And and I saw so many learning curves that I needed to overcome before I could publish one. And that was kind of the approach I had. Thankfully, I got over that in about March of 2019 when I said, if I'm going to do it, I've got to do it now, right? Yep. (laughs) Kind of to just jump the gun and do it. Yeah, you kind of just have to like rip the bandaid off and be like, all right, my first one or my first couple, they're not going to be great, but I got to get out there and then I can learn from my mistakes and continue to grow. Right. And you know what? I have been so pleasantly surprised and humbled and just encouraged by the feedback I've gotten from just publishing a handful of episodes so far. I've gotten emails from people that I don't know, just a couple, right? But just those few emails are so encouraging when they say, hey, I listened to this episode. I'm so excited that you talked about that. And they maybe ask me a question and I don't even always know the answer. But to respond back and say, I love that you're asking that question and thanks for listening. Let's keep this conversation going, right? And so that's been so motivating for me to get over those issues of like perfectionism and imposter syndrome, all of that, and just to do it. Exactly. And and I love those questions, especially when like we might not know what the answer is, but then we right. can reach <laughs> out to other people and bring them on and have them talk about their experience and their expertise with it. Because there's no way that we're all like we're going to know everything there is about OT, but everybody has a different lens, different experience and a different knowledge base and bringing them on, it just adds, it adds to the tool belt and it adds to the whole complexity and the uniqueness of our profession. Absolutely. I want to kind of go back though to what I was saying before, if it's okay with sort of that, those feelings of like, I can't do this. I'm going to wait. And, and it's so funny when you ask me about why did I start a podcast and I'm not an avid podcast listener. Now I am actually now that's like all I listen to and it's all the time. (laughs) Converted. Yay. (laughs) I know. Converted like the day I published and I was like, you know, I need to do this. But it was a blessing in disguise that I was not a big podcast person because if we think about the timeline, there were definitely a handful of really good OT podcasts already out and that I would listen to occasionally or, you know, pop in on an episode. But the fact that I wasn't 
avidly searching for new podcasts is probably one of the main reasons why I still published. Mm, Okay. Here's why. Because so April of 2018, when I first was thinking, okay, is this something that I want to do? Yep. Okay. I'm going to do it. You had not yet published. Nope. Brock (laughs) had not yet published. (laughs) I'm trying to remember, did OT After Dark start since then? Or maybe, okay. OT Potential just started recently around the same time I did. All these fabulous podcasts that now I love listening to, if I had heard all of you before I started publishing and, and listened to you guys consistently, which I'm sorry, but now I'm a super fan, so it all makes <laughs> up for <it>, right? <laughs> if I had listened to you, I would have said, no one wants to hear my voice because there's so many great voices already out there. So I am actually so weirdly happy I didn't listen before because I, I would have thought there's no place for me. They're already doing everything. It's, it's so great what they're doing. And now sort of jumping into this community, finding all of you, meeting you guys, connecting on social media. And I'm just so glad I did it. And I don't know if I would have. I think the whole like limiting beliefs and self-doubt and what do I have to bring to the table? I, and, and like right now, yes, we're talking about starting a podcast, but this can apply across the board in any sort of realm. If somebody's thinking about starting a business or maybe even changing their practice area or going back to school for another degree or whatever it is, I think that negative feeling of like, why me? Like, I don't have anything special. I have nothing unique to share can be really detrimental. And I like, because I mean, even when I started, I'm like, oh, there are already amazing OT podcasts out there. And I kind of had that like, well, what am I like, what am I going to do that's different? But you just never know what's going to resonate with somebody or who is going to resonate with somebody. And I think especially within just like the last couple months, because we've had a bunch of uh, new OT podcasts pop up, everybody is bringing something different to the table. And there is a uniqueness about everybody's show. And I'm like you, I'm like such a super fan of like everybody's shows out there. Yeah, there's so many good ones. Oh my my goodness. Everyone is so talented and just like you said, has their own sort of thing that makes them different. And it's so fun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I feel like we should talk about one of the things that makes your show a little unique. Even in the title, it says that, you know, it's OT Uncorked. So what is it? What's your fun little twist? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I feel like there was a pun in there with twist. With the I, know. Cork. That was I was like, I was like trying, I was trying to, and I was like, twist, twist off. Let's see, maybe. Well, it was a perfect transition there. Um, so OT Uncorked is all about uncorking hot topics and occupational therapy with a bottle of wine. So I already mentioned I love learning, I love socializing, and I'm a big fan of wine. So as a wino, I thought I need to, I need to weave this in there somewhere. <laughs> So I thought, what better way to kind of sit back, have casual conversation with people than over a glass of wine? And that's been kind of fun for me too. Just, I don't know, trying new wines, talking with people about what they like, and just kind of connecting over yet another common interest. And yeah, I just think it kind of creates a fun little casual atmosphere. And it's funny because I, that was kind of my main intention when I started was just, hey, let's relax with a glass of wine. If you're listening on your ride home, It's almost like you're sitting down with friends. You're not drinking while you drive, right? (laughs) Plug right there. Uh Safety (laughs) first. (laughs) Safety first, health first. But if you are driving home from work and you just want to kind of call your friend, right? That's what I want to do. I want to get home. I want to call a friend or I want to sit down with a glass of wine. It's like I want that atmosphere to come through the podcast. Yeah. And I think too, a lot of times, like when people are talking about podcasts, they're always talking about, you know, these are the conversations that we have with our colleagues and our friends after the presentation or after after work when you are going out to a restaurant or going out to a bar or just hanging out at home and it really is kind of those like casual conversations and just learning from each other and it doesn't have to be a powerpoint presentation and like super structured but just really kind of informal and just fun but my question for you is because i know i know you like wine but (laughs) what about you know there are some people that are out there that yeah, wine's okay, but they might like another drink of choice. <laughs> is this podcast also for them? It is so for them. I do not discriminate against beverage choice uh, or anything really, but mostly, you know, anybody can be on the show. You can drink water if you want, get a little crazy, add some lemon to it, <laughs> or you can sit down with wine, um, an episode that, be on the lookout for it, we drink beer. Whoa, Ooh. crazy. <laughs> We're really branching out here. Um but it's so for you. If you like wine, you know, I just give a brief little overview of what we're drinking um, and kind of 
I post it on the resource blog at my website. And it's a fun little feature, but it's not the focus of the podcast. So I've gotten some people who've said, you know, I think it's so fun, you give a wine recommendation. And I think other people probably don't even really process that part of the podcast. So I, if you like OT, this podcast is for you. <laughs> <laughs> and if you like wine, it's like a bonus feature. There you go. Well, and I know that sometimes you'll actually get a wine that the name ties into the topic that you were talking <laughs> about too. So just, again, another little added bonus to it. But yeah, I'm loving what you're putting out so far. I think it's been great. And you've had about five go out so far, right? Yeah, I think so. And thank you for listening. It's it's so nice to hear that people are actually tuning in. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. As soon as I met you at AOTA, I'm like, yep, all right. Like, I'm going to go find you and I'm going to listen. But I I actually have another question about about podcasts because I feel like you can learn a lot about somebody by the podcast that they listen to. I want to know, what would you say is your favorite? Or if there's a couple, you could give me like a top three or top five of your favorite podcasts that you listen to outside of the OT podcast. Sure, because the OT podcasts are given. I love them all. Mm -hmm. And outside of that, so I, a couple that I've been listening to recently, one is called Before Breakfast. And I actually don't even know how to pronounce her last name, but it's with Laura Vanderkam, I believe is how you say it. And she gives like five to 10 minute little blurbs about kind of like helpful tips for making yourself more productive or just living a little more efficiently or making better choices for your health. And just there are these little snippets that are so helpful and things that I maybe don't always think about. But it's I also love it because a lot of the suggestions are kind of OT. So I guess I really don't stray that far. But <laughs> it's, it's always easy to apply everything back to OT. <laughs> That's so true. Yeah, it's, it is. Um, one of my favorite podcasts is called the Proverbs 31 Ministries podcast. It's a faith-based podcast mostly led by women. And I really enjoy those kind of pieces of encouragement throughout my week. I also really enjoy the Stuff You Should Know podcast. I know it's pretty cool. It's um, by How Stuff Works, or I guess they're associated with a How Stuff Works. I don't know how that how that works, but I issued an episode <laughs> on it. Um, <laughs> and they talk about just the most random things. And it's so fun. It's like those random, I listened to one a couple weeks ago. It was a two-parter about the Hoover Dam. Okay, never, ever going to need to know that, but so cool that I do. And they talk about literally anything. So I enjoy their kind of randomness and they're, they're total nerds. So it's the best. There's also some history podcasts that I've been kind of dabbling in. The things like, you know, the stuff you missed in history class. And I think there's one called like history debunked or something like that. Ah. So yeah, so I like kind of getting some fun. I'm, I'm all about fun facts. Okay, so you have to know this. <laughs> I do a lot of presentations at work to bring evidence into the clinic. And one of my, I'm known for it now is to start every presentation with a fun fact. And I'll tell you what, sometimes with these topics, it's really hard to find a fun fact, but I, I find them. So I'm all about listening to podcasts where I can, where I can learn a fun trick here and there. All right. So I have to ask then, give us a fun fact. Oh my gosh, you put me on the spot. Yep. Let me think. Well, yep. they're all health related. That's okay. Whatever you got. Okay, I'll give you one. Okay, I did a presentation about Parkinson's disease the other day. Okay. I gave them a fun fact. I said, which of the following foods would interact most with levodopa, which is the most common drug used to um, treat some of the symptoms of Parkinson's? And I gave them the options of grapefruit, bacon, or broccoli. So I've got to let you you guess. You have to guess one. <laughs> oh, no. oh, now you're going to put me <laughs> on the spot. You on the spot, yeah. Oh, grapefruit? Bacon or broccoli? Well, being that yeah. uh, I do not work with that population. Um, oh, man. I really hope it's not bacon because I love bacon. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 you know, I'm going to go with bacon just because it stands out. It is bacon because <laughs> it's high in protein. So really any high protein food is going to compete for absorption. And so you're not going to get the maximum effect of levodopa. So People with Parkinson's should not consume a high protein meal around the same time they take their medications. Uh huh. Well, I couldn't have told you why, but. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, poor bacon. I love myself some bacon. Same. I was <laughs> disappointed when I heard that fact, but hey, it's the more you know. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? There's other like bacon alternatives. So I feel like there could be ways around it if need be. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> if need be, if, if emergency strikes, right? <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh, that's too funny. I love it. I love it. Oh my, I'm, just, I'm gonna have to like randomly like text you and be like, give me a fun fact for the day. <laughs> oh my gosh, now I've got to really, I've got to listen to a lot more podcasts because right. I need to get some more. <laughs> All right. So I want to get a little glimpse into kind of what the future looks like for you. And if you have anything fun or interesting that's coming up on the horizon. Yeah. So I'm pretty excited that I will be starting a PhD program in occupational science starting in the fall of 2019. So I am really excited about that change. It's going to be a, definitely a different pace and a totally different day to day. But I, like I said, I'm always up for a challenge and I never like to get too comfortable. So I think it'll be really good. Can I ask you what, I mean, I, I know as we've been talking, you've been saying a lot about evidence and research and constantly learning, but what really drew you to taking that step into applying and wanting to get into a PhD program? So in school, I really loved a lot of the opportunities to dive into a question that was kind of bugging me and look into answers and then test out those answers and, and on field work, kind of see what was working, see what wasn't working. I think we all enjoyed that to some extent. But as we went into more of the research-based courses, I was like really loving it. And I thought that was totally normal and that every OT was loving writing research papers. It turns out not everybody loves that. <laughs> I was like trying not to laugh because I'm like, nope, it's not like that at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just was really enjoying it. And so I kind of became a joke within my cohort that I always wrote too many pages, whereas other people were trying to see how they could meet the page limit. I was usually about double the page limit. And the longest part of my writing process still is trying to cut out words so I can fit the page requirement. <laughs> Consolidation. Um, consolidation. It seriously, I mean, they would say write a five page paper and I'd look up from my screen and have 12 written and say, well, we gotta, we gotta do something about this. I just love it. It's so engaging for me and so fun and investigative. And I think that's just something that really gets me, gets me going. So yeah. So that kind of became a joke that I was always the one writing too much. And then on top of that, whenever a classmate would have a really smart, just really smart comment about something they were learning or an idea they had, one of our professors would say, that is so cool. You should research that. And the joke became, no, it's okay. Miranda will do it for us. <laughs> <laughs> so somehow you always like, I, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm starting to notice a little bit of theme. Like you knew OT very early on and then you knew like, re, like you wanted to go into research very early on. And it just like, everything's just kind of fallen into place. And it is Super exciting to hear your passion and to hear your motivation to pursuing a PhD and going out and really kind of changing the face of research and adding to our, what's the word? Our, I don't know, literary bucket? That doesn't sound right. Literary. Hey, I like it. We could start it. It could be a thing. Like that? <laughs> Make it a thing. A literary bucket. Let's do it. I'm going to add to it. We're going to add. Gonna... Yeah, you're going to go add to the literary bucket. <laughs> I'm going to use that. Make, I'm making it up. <laughs> no, it's perfect. Aren't, aren't we all, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, something, though, I do want to kind of share is that I knew I had the interest for research, and I think I have a lot of the skills. Like I said, I was a writing tutor for many years. I got to interact with a lot of writers and work with them through their process, which helped refine my own process. And I realized I had some of the skills that I think are really important for a researcher to have, and I want to keep developing those skills. So in that way, it kind of fell into place in my mind that that was something I would do eventually down the line. And I had almost this kind of guilt of not wanting to stay in clinical practice full time, you know, so soon out of school. And I, yeah, I felt this kind of guilt. So I said, I'm going to wait five, 10 years, and then maybe I'll go back and get my PhD and then pursue that. But for now, this is what I need to do. And then I attended the Summit of Scholars event in last summer. And I met with a lot of other people kind of in my position, some of whom were still sort of trying to figure out if research is something they wanted to do. And other, others of us who were already engaging in research and wanted to keep 
keep going with that. But I got to meet all these scholars in our field and talk with them about my interests and hear what they've done, hear what their experiences are. And after that weekend, it was only a few days, but it was so pivotal for me because they told me research is a practice area within occupational therapy. And it's not straying from Yes, it's maybe not fully clinical practice, but it's still an important practice area that fits into the greater scope of what OT is. And that was really empowering for me to say, yeah, you know what? I'm still an OT if I do research. I am still contributing to my profession just in a different way. And that kind of helped me take the leap sooner, which is ultimately what I really wanted. But I felt that kind of guilt about it. So I want to share that in case anyone else is feeling that way. Oh, thank you for saying that because I... Yeah, like I, I, I've heard that before where a lot of people are like, well, I just need to go practice. I need to get experience before I can do research. And while, yes, it can be important, I don't think it's 100% necessary because I think you could be a good researcher with very little experience out in the clinical realm because you're utilizing kind of a different skill set in order to accomplish that research. And clearly, you're not waiting the five to 10 years. <laughs> you're waiting. <laughs> no. A year? <laughs> right. Maybe ten, 10 months, 10, ten months, months instead of 10 know. years, something like that. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's, it's just kind of one of those things to prove that like, even as a new practitioner, you can get into research and you can choose your own path. And it doesn't always have to be, oh, I have to be in practice for X amount of years, or I have to do this before I can do this. It's like, no, if you want to do it, you'll find a way and you'll figure it out and you'll do it. I wanted to kind of just highlight the connecting with like-minded individuals. I think that's so pivotal in really kind of bringing about that awareness of ourselves. And so you knew you wanted to do this, but you felt like you had to do something else. And then when you went to that summit of scholars, that's when it was like, oh, I can do this because you were surrounded by other people that also shared that same passion. And you're like, yeah, okay, the time is now. I'm going to go do it. That was exactly it. That con- yeah, that connecting with, with people like-minded and people who challenge you too, who maybe aren't like-minded, but get you thinking a different way is also really important. So the kind of finding that balance, just not getting super comfortable with, I don't know, I guess that's my, that's, I feel like that's a theme that I keep saying, like, don't get too comfortable, you know, meet people that challenge you to pursue what you want to do. And then also question why you want to do what you're doing. And it just gives you that confidence to move forward. Yep. And that was big for me. Well, there's a quote and it's, uh, it's something along the lines of, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. And right. I love that. Yeah. Like it just, it resonates so well with me because you want to surround yourself with people that challenge you, that support you, but also challenge you and push you to become better. And I mean, the people that I have met within this OT community through podcasting, through social media, at conferences, I'm just like, wow, like they motivate me. They inspire me. They challenge me. They push me to be better. Uh, I love that you just said that because I think that's just so important to progressing and becoming, like I said earlier, becoming that 1% better every day. Yeah. And I think part of what that hopefully will look like in my career is including people who are actively in practice into my research or even keeping a foot in the clinical, in a clinical role. I don't know what that'll look like for me yet, but having people included in my research who are on the front lines, you know, seeing what's working, seeing what the current issues that people are facing. I think the issue comes about when, when research is totally separate from that practical application. If you want to do translational science, or if you want to do intervention and implementation science, it's so important to stay connected with that, that perspective. And so for even new clinicians or clinicians who have been in the field for a while, who are interested in research, but just say, hey, a PhD is not for me, or academia is not for me, find someone who is doing research and provide a much needed clinical perspective. You're seeing what people need, tell the people who are studying it. So there's an evidence base to support you know, what you want to be doing and addressing with your clients. So like we can all play a role in research, PhD or not. Oh, that is, that is really, oh gosh. I'm like, I don't even know what to say to that. That's fantastic. (laughs) Cause I feel like a lot of times, at least in my lens, like I feel like you have to be one or the other. You have to be a clinician, you have to be a practitioner or you have to be a researcher. And I love the fact that you're like, you can keep one foot in one and be doing the other or doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Like, I think that's just great advice. Yeah, I think it's helped me sort of conceptualize where I'm moving forward and how I can kind of do it all, right? We all want to, we all want to have it all and do it all, right? And so I see this as my way of kind of doing everything that appeals to me within OT. And 
I'm excited what it's going to look like. I don't know yet, but um, I think it's going to be great. I think it's really going to help me use the skills that I'm most excited to develop. And yeah, I want to make a difference with it. So we'll have to wait and find out. (laughs) Yeah, I'm excited for you. I, oh my gosh, just like hearing your passion and hearing just how excited you are about this. I'm like, yeah, all right, this girl, she's she's going places. She's going to make some big changes within our profession. And I'm really excited to see what happens with your podcast and see what happens with your PhD and your career. And I am, oh, this has been so much fun, but... Before we go, I can't let you go without asking a couple more questions. Oh, man. <laughs> Thought I was going to escape this. Nope. No. <laughs> I <Nope>. love it. <laughs> Not at all. First off, one word. You knew this was coming. One I word know. to describe occupational therapy. I thought about this one a lot, and I can't quite capture it in one word, but I'll, I'll throw something out there that came to me today. Okay. <laughs> I think I see OT. Let's see which one I want to use. I think, (laughs) well, I have, I have a couple ideas. They're all kind of similar. I just, it's so hard to capture. You you ask a good question. Mm -hmm. You should like interview people as part of your, oh, wait, you already, (laughs) you already do. I think I would choose, we're kind of like a gate. I think occupational therapy is kind of a gate because, and we're maybe as occupational therapists, like the gatekeepers, if we're going to be all 21st century, maybe like passcode, because who uses keys and gates anymore, but (laughs) But we'll go, we'll go with the gate one where I feel like people who we're serving and who we're partnering with see there's obstacles to what they want and need to do. And with occupational therapy, we don't always need to be jumping through hoops or jumping over that fence or whatever analogy we want to run with here. I think occupational therapists help not just overcome barriers, but help identify ways that we can engage differently in what we want to do on the other side of that gate or on the other side of that fence. And I think we just really open up doors for people. And I love analogies. And um, just open up opportunities for people where they're not needing to necessarily navigate the environment that's in front of them that has a lot of barriers, socially, virtually, physically, whatever environments you're in or context you're in, you know, we have a way to say, no, that environment, that context you want to engage in, that is for you. Let's find a way to get you there and do what you want to do. And so I really see OT as just a way to open up doors for people into what they want and need to do. So yeah, that's my answer. Wow. Uh, That was amazing. I'm like, (laughs) I don't even know how to respond. Like when you first said it, I'm like, gate, I'm like, gate, gate belt. I'm like, okay, where should, <laughs> where should going with this? And then as soon as you started explaining it, I'm like, oh my God, like literally, <laughs> literally the doors opened up and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that is fantastic. Uh, nobody has said that yet. And I think that oh, is I didn't think so. <laughs> amazing. Yeah. No, nope. Nobody has said that yet. Fantastic. Huh. Oh, I'm going to like go marinate on that for a little bit. Cause I think that is just so empowering so strong I love it absolutely love it okay last question if people want to get in contact with you learn more about your podcast where can they find you thank you for asking that so you can find OT uncorked on any hopefully most podcast players that you listen to podcasts on so I'm on iTunes Google Play Music Stitcher Overcast some of the major ones and it's just OT uncorked uncorked like a bottle of wine and I'm also on Twitter Instagram and Facebook all with the handle at OT uncorked I also have a website OT uncorked.com and on there I have a resource blog so after each episode I write a little blog post highlighting some of the resources that were mentioned in the post or I'm sorry in the podcast and maybe some additional things that we didn't talk about in case people are interested in that topic. It can kind of hopefully motivate that continued learning process. And if you want to email me, I'm Miranda at otuncorked.com. Perfect. Well, I definitely wanted to tell all of my listeners to go check out your show. It's fantastic. And I can't wait to see what you have in the works. It sounds like you got some really fantastic episodes that are coming out. And yeah, like I said before, I'm really inspired and I cannot wait to see what your OT journey and your OT career has in store for you. So thank you so much for coming on the show today, Miranda. Thank you so much. This was so fun, kind of turning the tables a little bit. I really enjoyed this. 
Hey, before you go, I just wanted to say thanks for listening to today's episode. If you want to further the discussion, go to our website, otforlife.com, and join our Facebook group. If you like us, here are three easy ways to let us know. One, share our podcast with a friend, colleague, or anyone interested in occupational therapy. Two, leave us a review on iTunes or anywhere this podcast is found. Three, subscribe to us so you don't miss out on any upcoming episodes. Thanks again. We'll catch you next time, OT for Lifers. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> I'm just a mess today. The world is upside down. Yeah. ATR, not ATR. <laughs> I was like, I'm just saying this brain. Oh, yeah, I was goodness. like, all right, reflex. So that is fun. Yeah. Yeah, uh huh. No, ATR. I woke up with a little bit of a cold, so my my voice is a little <clears throat> not so great today. <laughs> you know what they say? What did they say? Light. I say you know what they say, and I don't even know what it is. Um, what was it? Oh, no. So I'll take I'll take my year of experience. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> I was actually doing some volunteer work in Han. Well, actually, I should start this over. I was actually, I know, I'm probably like not going to be able to talk much. (laughs) I'm just going to let you talk. (laughs) Okay. Hey, I am a talker, so (laughs) we'll make it work. I, you know, I knew you were going to ask that because I heard you ask other people that. And every time you ask it, I think really hard about it. (laughs) Yeah. I go, I go like way back on, um, on the whole like Facebook MySpace era. And I was one of, I wasn't the first university, but I was one of like the very first groups to be included into the Facebook. The, the Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> yeah. Like this is before it was opened up to everything, everybody. It was only open to uh, a few select universities. Wow. Um, I'm cool. Yep. That does make you sound old, but that mm-hmm. is so cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me think on that for a moment. Yeah. No problem. What was it? What was I prepared to tackle? Honestly, <laughs> <laughs> I was not prepared to tackle anything. Like, is it reading more literature? Or no, I don't like where I'm going with that. Okay, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> Just give me one moment while I think about oh, yeah, it, so yeah, I don't yeah, get it. Yeah, you're fine. <laughs> I'm totally putting on this, putting you on the spot. You said it, so I'm like, I gotta ask one. First.